Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. May the Lord God bless you richly, bless you and bless your family as you gather together this Thursday to celebrate Thanksgiving. It's a time when we gather together as family. We gather with close friends to celebrate and be thankful for things that we've enjoyed throughout the year. We appreciate the blessings of Almighty God. We appreciate what He has done for us. We look back and we say, thank you, Lord, for blessing us with such and such. So in keeping with the season, our message today is entitled, An Attitude of Gratitude. Some people have an ungrateful heart. They have an ungrateful attitude because they have an ungrateful heart. No matter how much you do for this person, no matter how much you try to encourage that person, they are never satisfied. They don't want it, they don't like it, and they don't want anyone else to like it or to enjoy it either. It's like they're perpetually miserable. My mother used to say that misery loves company, and that's how they are. They feel miserable, and they want everybody else to partake in the misery with them. Their hearts are hard and callous. They're neither grateful nor are they thankful for any of the blessings that they enjoy. No matter if it was a big blessing or maybe a small blessing or even an insignificant blessing, it does nothing to their hearts. But that's not how God wants us to be. God wants us to be grateful. He wants us to have thankful heart. He wants us to have an attitude of gratitude. So turn with me please to our scripture found in Luke chapter 6 verse 6 through 11. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is in their synagogue. He's in the synagogue and he's teaching and the religious leaders are watching him and, uh, and they're trying to find something that they can use to accuse him. It doesn't matter what he's about to do. It doesn't matter that he wants to do something good. It doesn't matter that he's healing people that need the healing. They've been sick their entire life. And Jesus is about to heal them. But they do not care about that. They just care about their own selves. Their hearts are never satisfied. All right, let us read our scripture found in Luke chapter 6, verse 6 through 11. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. Let us get this picture straight. I want us to focus what's happening at that time in our minds, in our imagination. This is a man in their synagogue with a withered hand. He has never had the use of his right hand. He comes to their synagogue every Sabbath, but no one cares whether he is getting along. No one cares whether his hand is healed or not. They don't even notice him really until Jesus comes along and brings attention to him. When Jesus visited their synagogue, somehow he became the focus of everybody's attention. So they would watch Jesus very closely. Instead of being grateful for a potential mighty move of God, they watched him closely because they knew that Jesus was going to do 
something good. They knew that he was about to heal this man with the withered hand. He was not going to go home the same way he's been going home Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. And you know what? There are churches just like that in our time, right here today. Sunday after Sunday, their parishioners crowd their pews with problems. Their parishioners and worshipers come with trouble, loaded down with a load of care. Many are plagued with harassing and tormented spirits, and no one lifts a hand to try to free these people from their heavy burdens. Anxiety and depression are the choice weapons of the enemy. Many Christians, even some pastors, are plagued with such heavy depression that they can't even leave their homes, sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months. And some even commit suicide. And the church is powerless to do anything about it. And a lot of the times it's because of the backlash that they receive. In those days, they had the religious leaders watching and monitoring. Today, we have the internet trolls who do nothing else but watch to see what's going on in somebody's church. And they do the same thing that those religious, was, religious leaders were doing. Only thing at a grander scale. They look. They ridicule the pastor. They run the church down. They say all manner of evil against the pastor and the church and the worshipers. And that's exactly what was happening to Jesus. But the scriptures said that he knew their thoughts. He knew they were chopping at the bit to find something to accuse him of. But he was not dissuaded. He did not let that discourage him. He did not let their ungrateful hearts stop him from doing good on the Sabbath. So just as those scribes and those Pharisees thought, or at least they were probably hoping, Jesus called the man to him. And you can just imagine they were rubbing their hands together and salivating at the thought of having a chance to have something to accuse Jesus of. After calling the man with the withered hand to him, Jesus gets up from his sitting position and he stands next to the man and he looks straight into their eyes, each one of those religious leaders. He looks dead into their eyes and he asks this question. Luke chapter six, verse nine. I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or destroy it? But you know what? Not one of those men would answer Jesus a, a single word. Not one of them. Because they all knew in their hearts that what he was saying was correct. It was the right thing to do. But they themselves were tied up with this religious spirit. They knew that it was God's will to do good always, regardless of the day. Whether it was a Sabbath day or whether it was a middle day, a week, a day in the middle of the week. It didn't matter. God's thought is to do good and do good always. Their law states in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 9. When the people of the land come before the Lord at their appointed feasts, he who enters at the north gate to worship shall go out the south gate. And he who enters by the south gate shall go out by the north gate. No one shall return by way of the gate by which he entered, but each shall go out straight ahead. The appointed feast referred to here also includes the Sabbath. Even the daily offerings. No one was or is to come before the Lord to worship 
and then leave the same way that they came. There is to be a change into their lives. A change in their attitude, a change in their worship, a change in their situation. There is to be a change. This man, the man with the withered hand, was an example of that law. He came to church, he came to worship, but he always left the same way that he came. But that day, Jesus showed up. He, when he showed up in their service, he asked the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? And since no one would answer him, he told the man to stretch out his hand and the man did so. The amazing thing is, as the man did so, his hand was restored. His hand was healed. Jesus did not say anything. He did not lay hands on the man. He did not even pray. Yet the man's hand was completely and totally restored. This should have been an exciting time, a time of rejoicing. Their God had showed up big time. Their God had done an extremely great miracle. He had healed this man who had been suffering all his life, who had been handicapped all his life. They should have been celebrating, but instead the scribes and the Pharisees were filled with fury and discussed with which and discussed with each other what they might do to him, what they might do to Jesus. Can you just believe that? Can you imagine that instead of celebrating, instead of being thankful, they're looking to destroy Jesus. A great miracle had just taken place, but the hardness and the ungratefulness of their hearts blinded them to the greatness of God. It blinded them to the love of Jesus. Over and over again, the scriptures instructs us to give thanks, to have a grateful heart, and to be thankful for all that our God has blessed us with, has done for us. This Thursday, November 23rd, 2023, is Thanksgiving Day. It should be a day of reflection. Our hearts are to look back and be thankful. We should reflect on the blessings and the provision of our Lord God, what he has bestowed upon us. In November 1621, the pilgrims did just that. After a successful first corn harvest, Governor William Bradford organized a celebratory feast to celebrate the blessings and the provision of God. He invited a group of the fledgling colonies, Native American allies, including the Wampanoag chief, Masoret. According to History.com, this was the first Thanksgiving meal celebrated here in the New World. Today, American families around the world will celebrate this memorial meal with turkey, stuffing, and all the trimmings, mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin pie. It's a festive time and families and close friends gather together to eat and to celebrate. And although Thanksgiving has lost much, much of its original religious significance, it is still a time-honored celebration that we still observe today. Then to add to the festivities, there's the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which first took place in 1924. Next year will be their 100 year anniversary. Then of course, there's football. Some people will say, well, what is Thanksgiving without football? Although the pilgrims are credited 
with the first American Thanksgiving, it was God who instructed the Israelites to come after their harvest and eat and drink and celebrate before their God and give thanks to him for all he had blessed them with. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 through 29. It is God's desire or his will that we as his people be thankful to him for he is good and his love endures forever. Look at how he instructed the Levites to give thanks during the time of the law. First Chronicles chapter 23, verse 30. And they were to stand every morning thanking and praising the Lord and likewise at evening. The Levites were instructed to stand every single morning and every single evening to thank the Lord and to praise him for his goodness toward Israel. Modern medicine, namely the Mayo Clinic, states that gratitude should be practiced daily. But God already knew that because he was the one who designed us that way. And that is why he commanded the Israelites to give thanks daily. Not just daily, but twice daily. And in fact, he, they were to stand and they would say, Thank you, Lord, every single morning. They would stand and say, Thank you, God, every single evening without fail. That was the, to, to foster a heart of thankfulness, a heart of gratitude. It's an attitude of gratitude. And so that is why the scriptures scream, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 34. Because of all of the good that it does us, God desires for his people to be thankful, to have a thankful heart, to have a gratitude an attitude of gratitude. It's like medicine to the heart. Apparently, science has proved that gratitude contributes to a healthier heart. It is also a strong medicine against depression because it brings cheer or happiness to the person and banishes negative thoughts. And that's why Paul wrote this to the Thessalonian church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is God's will in Christ Jesus that we give thanks in all circumstances. Not for all circumstances, mind you, but in all circumstances, which doesn't make it a whole lot easier, a little easier for sure, but not a whole lot easier. See, when tears are flowing and the heart is aching and a great big void in the middle of your soul throws you down on a bed of grief and suffering, it is not that easy to be thankful. It's not that easy to, to muster up a thankful heart. But nevertheless, it is the will of our Father who is in heaven because it improves your relationship with him. It improves your situation here on the earth. And our religion is all about relationship, both with our God and with our fellow human beings. I want to give you five suggestions to help build your attitude of gratitude. They are number one. First and foremost, you will have to start becoming conscious becoming aware of the blessings that you enjoy in your life. And you must realize that they're all, each and every one of them, they all come from our God. Because if we think or we believe that we are the source of our comforts, because after all, we work very hard to buy these comforts, we begin to foster a sense of self-sustainability. Therefore, we must acknowledge that all blessings come from God. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of Lights. Number two, don't just focus on the big things in life, but focus on the little things as well and be thankful for them. You know, we've been packing shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child for the last almost 20 years now. My youngest daughter, Ari, she heads the whole thing up. From the time she was just a young child, she would save her Christmas money. She would save her birthday money in order to buy nice toys to put in her boxes. I want you to see the gratitude of these children, some of which have never received a Christmas present or a nice gift for that matter, even ever, ever in their life. They've never received something nice. I want you to watch this uh, video. Three, two, one. When that shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoeboxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled, and we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes, thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. children are overjoyed to receive such a small thing. To us, it's just a small little shoebox. But to them, it's a huge, huge thing. See, that is a true attitude of gratitude. Because in many, many cases, that one shoebox will not only change their life, the life of that child, but it will change their destiny as well. They've never had something so nice in their life. To think that someone that they don't even know cared enough about them, to send them toys for Christmas, and to say, we love you and Jesus loves you, changes their lives, not just their lives, but their destiny. That's what true gratitude does. It changes your life. It changes your destiny. Number three, express your gratitude in words and emotions. Meaning, say thank you and mean it. Put a smile on your face and mean it. Record it in your gratitude journal and your attitude towards gratitude will begin to take root and begin to grow and begin to blossom and begin to bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Record it. Speak it. Number four, Paul told the Thessalonians church to be thankful in all circumstances, meaning we as Christians must look for the positive in the negative. All of this negative that's going on, we're to look for the positive in that and be thankful for the positive. When things don't work out the way that we anticipate, sometimes, a lot of the times actually, it's for our best that God does not make it work out or God does not let it work out. It's for our own best interest. God will only give us what is best for us. Although he will allow us to take that which he would prefer we not. But he will allow it because he's a God who gives us choices. Number five, stop complaining or blaming someone else. Be thankful for what you have and take responsibility 
for your own mistakes and learn from your own mistakes. Remember, success is built on a foundation of failure. Meaning, if at first you do not succeed, try, try again. Those failures will form your foundation for what will work and for what will succeed. So this Thanksgiving, begin to nurture an attitude of gratitude. Make it your number one priority to nurture that attitude of gratitude. Don't take things, little things, big things, any things for granted. My granddaughter, when she was little, she would play with each and every toy that she got with the same amount of enthusiasm. It was like she did not want one to feel inferior to the other. Both great and small, they all received the same amount of attention. And that's how God expects us to be. To be grateful for the large blessings, but to be equally grateful for the small blessings. See, Job said, shall I only accept good from God and not bad as well? Job chapter 2 verse 10. The answer is yes. We should accept both. We must accept good, but we must equally accept and be prepared to accept bad as well. Life is not a bed of thornless roses that give special fragrance that never fades. But rather, life is like a railroad track that a train runs on. On one side are the blessings and the comforts of life. But at the same time, running parallel is the other set of tracks. That in the midst of all the promotions, in the midst of all the awards, are the misfortunes of life. We are not promised all sunshine. We're not promised all fun and games. There is rain. There are storms with lightning and thunder. There's the smell of fertilizer. All of these things are a part of life. So let me ask you, are you given life or are you living life selfishly? Meaning, are you expecting only huge breakthroughs and absolutely no failure? If you're afraid to fail at something, it is because you are prideful. And maybe you're trying to mask your pride of, of life with, I'm a perfectionist. God is the only being that is incapable of failure. He's the only one who does not make mistakes. We all are like a broken reed sometimes that pricks the hand. We are capable of making mistakes. God is the only one who is incapable of making a mistake. Sometimes we are like a single key on a piano that's out of tune. That single key when hit gives the wrong tune at the wrong time. And it's noticeable. That is what an ungrateful heart is like though. A broken key, a broken reed that pricks the hand. It is out of time, it is out of season. God's will for each and every one of us is to have an attitude of gratitude. So again, let me encourage you this Thanksgiving to give thanks with a grateful heart, to begin a lifelong season of Thanksgiving. And you can start with being thankful for salvation. Jesus purchased our salvation with his very own blood. He bought our salvation with his death. And his resurrection. See, what I mean is this. God has a law, and that law says the soul 
that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. And we all have sinned, each and every one of us. And now there's only one penalty left for us, death. But thanks to Jesus Christ, who died in our place and was raised to life again on the third day, has offered us eternal life because he died for each and every one of us. He died for you. He died for me. He died for our families. And he's offering us the free gift of life that he purchased. If we accept his free gift of life, we can live with him forever even throughout all eternity. The only thing he asks of us is that we love him and that we obey or that we keep his commandments. So let me ask you, would you like to accept Jesus' free gift of life? If you would, all you have to do is to ask. How do you ask? You pray and you believe and Jesus will hear the prayer of faith. And he will bring salvation to you. He will come to you and live in you. So if you want to accept Jesus as your own personal Savior, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to have an attitude of gratitude. Help me to love you and to love others to appreciate you and to appreciate my fellow humans. Lord, lead me in a path of righteousness that I might live my life solely for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to buy your Bible or get a Bible off your shelf and dust it off and begin to read it. Read your Bible every day. That's how you learn about God. That's how you draw close to Him. That's how you find His promises for you. Because if you don't know your promises, you can't stand on them. Read your Bible every day. Find a Bible believe in church. One who still believes in the move and in the power of the Holy Spirit. One who still believes in righteousness and holiness. Believe in living a certain way. A way that's pleasing to our God. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving from my family to your family. Be blessed and stay blessed.